Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Detective Ridiculous. My name is Bricky. My co-host is DK, and he's going to be telling us all about the only thing more frightening than Warhammer, real life. But before we get into that, if you enjoy this podcast, head on over to patreon.com slash Ridiculous to get access to all kinds of great new stuff, bloopers, Discord access, posters that arrive every single month and more patreon.com slash adeptus ridiculous and pick up some of that merchandise as well down in the description at orchidate.com get yourself posters shirts hoodies and more Ooh. one take easy wow yeah usually it takes like seven takes for bricky to get all the patreon stuff you guys can't hear it but shy has to put in some serious work for uh, bricky intros you know Did your mom raise a liar yep <laughs> yep i can tell yep. <laughs> she sure did <laughs> you bastard what i hey the people probably believe it you know i don't trust the people yeah so are are you are you ready for for real life today, Bricky? Are you ready for the real life happenings of of Detective Ridiculous? So I think earlier you were like, "Hey, Bricky, um, you know, remember that whole thing about wanting a short episode? That ain't gonna happen." Uh, uh yeah, and, and it's surprising because like this, I didn't expect this one to be a long one. So usually I write out like a like a script. So it kind of keeps me on track and I don't go wandering off all over the place, even though I still do. And, you know, usually I'll be in the ballpark of like seven, eight pages. This is 11. Oh, my God. So we should probably get started. What what uh, what God have I have I harmed to have this upon me? Your existence has offended all of the chaos gods, and I, I, I am their redeemer. Mm-hmm. Who is the chaos gods in real life? <laughs> There's just one. It's me. It's you. It's me. All right, let's uh, hear it. But we've we've got a pretty interesting case on Detective Ridiculous today because we're going over someone known as the Ballarat Bandit. Ballarat. And- the Ballarat Bandit. So, my mind is immediately going to, like, a ballerina rat. I assume... No, Ballarat is a place. Okay. Ballarat no, no, is no, a no. Place. I didn't actually think that was what it was, but that's where my mind you know, was going. I, I just gotta be sure with you sometimes. Well, okay. There, okay, <laughs> something, 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 pots and kettles. <laughs> But anyway, so this one actually happened fairly recently. Uh, It happened back in 2004. So it didn't happen just yesterday, but it's also not something that happened back in, like, the ye olden days of 1800s. It happened in the ye olden days of Unreal Tournament 2004. It is insane how you know the year of those games like that, just off the top of your head. That, you do realize that Unreal Tournament 2004 is the name of the game. Is it really? It's just yes. called Unreal Tournament 2. Well, okay, well then it makes sense how you know it. I'm a, <clears throat> how do you know how did you know when Unreal how Tournament did you know 2004 when Unreal came, Tournament out? came out? Anyway, if the name Ballarat doesn't sound familiar because you thought it was a ballerina rat or something, um it's because for all intents and purposes Ballarat is a ghost town. Well, and yeah, it's in that part of Cali. Yeah, and it's <laughs> it's not like a ghost story that has anything to do with ghosts living on a roof. So put away your satanic bullets or your satanic Bible and your silver bullets because we're fine. Uh, but legit, if you Google Ballarat and you look it up on a map, uh, it will quite literally be labeled Ballarat parentheses ghost town and parentheses. Google lists it as a literal ghost town. Literal. Literal ghost town. Current population is three. And two of those people, (laughs) two of those people run the Ballarat uh, uh, General Store. Where did where do they live? Uh, You know, we'll 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 talk about this desolate little place called Ballarat. Uh, But Ballarat is essentially this kind of 
nothing former mining town in Death Valley. And every source I've seen has been like, yeah, basically the only people living out in Death Valley, kind of around Ballarat, are people that have some kind of <clears throat> past that they either want to erase or they want to hide from or they want to just run away from. Because there are no one who lives in Death in Death Valley. The yeah. people want to live there. <laughs> Because, yeah, it's Death Valley. It's called that for a reason. Uh, summers there easily reach and surpass 120 degrees. Uh, even at its peak, because this used to be a mining town, it had, uh, back in the day, it had a little bit of a gold rush. There were some uh, nearby mines that had some gold in it. Even when the allure of riches was there, it only had a population of, like, 500 Times times were different. Also, Death Valley was about to have record heat recently uh, Ooh, of like oh, 132. Yeah, Yeesh. And, and, the, and people were like going to go to Death Valley to check out the heat. And I'm like, like, oh, yeah, that's normal human behavior. I can't wait to be in the hottest place in the world. And people like actually die there. People were going to Death Valley because, oh, my God, it's going to be so hot. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, That's, people are that weird. Is, that is not normal behavior. That is abnormal. All right. Anyway. Uh, but like I said, about the only thing in Ballarat worth mentioning these days is the general store. Uh, that and they actually have this cute little green mailbox with an antenna on it. And they're like, hey, everyone, you can mail letters to aliens here. All right. That's kind of uh, cute. That is that is kind of cute, right? Uh, but in early 2004, this little general store, the only thing Ballarat has going for it, had been robbed. Uh, it had apparently been robbed of a quad ATV, cash, uh, food, and a firearm. I think it was specifically a 22 caliber rifle uh, had been stolen from the general store. Uh, if I was a betting man, I'd say that that quad probably belonged to whoever was tending the store because I can't imagine a rinky dink little general store in a ghost town actually selling an ATV. I kind of love the idea. I mean, I mean, I'm sad that the guy got his quad stolen. But I'm mm -hmm. I'm very much like curious as to the whole like damn I got my quad stolen how am I gonna get out of here because he's living in <laughs> Death Valley Death Valley yeah I guess I guess he's just walking home you know? uh he ain't get oh. he, he ain't going home at all yeah I'm, I'm I guess I just live in the general store now so you know god damn poor guy yeah. So when you're basically in a ghost town, who exactly do you call when your general store has been robbed? The Ghostbusters. No, there are okay. no Ghostbusters. That does, that's just a movie, Ricky. I don't know if you knew that. It's just a movie. But I saw, I saw them at Universal Studios. Oh, well, I guess you can call them then. Uh, but the closest police office is actually in a place called Inyo County, uh, which is kind of sitting right between uh, Nevada and the Sierra Nevada. And according to Wikipedia, uh, half of Inyo County actually resides in Death Valley. So you call the Inyo County police. I'm assuming this is where Inyo Kern is. I have no idea, but that makes sense. Oh, I, I passed through Inyo Kern on the way when I drive to Vegas. So I, I, oh, I assume. It, yeah, that I, I would I would say yes, then. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, the other problem is that Inyo County is some three hours away from Ballarat. So if this was like an urgent call and it needed an immediate response, well, mm. you're kind of screwed. Uh, according to the officer who responded to the call, I think his name is Jeff Holloway, uh, the people living in the surrounding area kind of near Ballarat, they're getting a little scared because there's a bandit on the loose. And like we said, Inyo County is some three hours away. So if this on the loose bandit shows up to their little spot and robs them, what are they going to do? 
they're they're kind of screwed. So a lot of people in the area legitimately start to arm themselves for their own immediate protection because there is no way the police can get there in time if this bandit starts to just take liberties. Right. So yeah, the people around the area are <laughs> they're arming up. Right. I mean that that's pretty that's pretty common thing I believe in oh, like yeah. the uh, the more rural areas of America with low mm-hmm. low cop response. Yeah, I mean I'm sure the police don't love that idea but like you you got to do what you got to do. If the police can't show up for 3 hours, like you got to do what you got to do to protect yourself and your and your property. So, uh when you picture the terrain of Death Valley, you probably are immediately think of like vast deserts, mountains, hills, and of course it being just unbearably hot which is obviously pretty close to what the area is like, uh, but it also means that tracks are going to be relatively easy to spot and follow, especially tracks from an ATV, mm. which, of course, there are tracks from the ATV leading away from the general store. Uh, so there's a man named Terry Allen that's called in to sort of scope out the area. He's uh, he's the BLM ranger uh, for this little area, and that's the Bureau of Land Management. So he's called in. It's like, all right, we got we got to find this guy. You know, someone someone robbed the general store, and you know, we got to find him. So Terry's following these ATV tracks and footprints, and he actually finds that they do lead to uh, some campsites here and there. Uh, The tracks sometimes lead off in false directions, but he finds some campsites here and there, and some of them are kind of near, like, main roads, and that worries him a little bit, Um, but he doesn't ever find the bandit. The bandit is never at any of these campsites. Okay. And uh, in a true TV documentary, Terry actually believed that when he came up on, like, all of these campsites, that at some point, uh, the bandit could actually see him, like, through a scope or something. Uh, oh. Because because they're thinking, like, what the bandit is doing is he is getting high vantage points, and he is specifically waiting for, like, tourists campers hikers stuff like that and he's like oh i'm gonna i'm gonna scope out the campsite and i'm gonna wait for people to leave and then i'm gonna jump in there steal what i need and then just go that's a very um what was the movie with like chris pine and ben foster um with uh jeff bridges and and it was like a, a rural county oh no Oh no! Okay, I, our viewers will know what I'm talking about, and it, it gives me that vibe. It also it actually gives me a little bit of like a No Country for Old Men vibe. With oh like the, yeah, a little bit, sure. The super long range kind of scoping things out, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't I don't know how long range his stuff is, but you know, I mean, you know, you may not have a, a well a 22 rifle unless Chat can can t- uh, I said Chat comment section. You know what I mean? <laughs> yes, um, I do. You're a streamer. Unle- I get it. Unless one of them is able to correct me, I'm assuming that a 22 rifle is not the uh, premier choice of long range weaponry because it is an itty bitty little bullet. Yeah, probably not. Probably so I'm not, going but... to assume. Yeah, but uh, he he's 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 chasing these campsites day in, day out for like two months Two months, every day, he's like, oh, my God, I keep finding campsites. Uh, I keep finding just tracks. Some tracks lead nowhere. Some tracks lead to campsites. And it's just, oh, what a nightmare. Uh, But for these two months, while he's trying to track him down, people are still getting robbed. Tourists are still getting robbed. Hikers are still getting robbed. Uh, Survivalists are still getting robbed. Um, So authorities are... No closer to finding him after two months. They keep finding empty or abandoned campsites where the bandit had been. They could just never get the jump on him. And it seemed like he was always somehow one step ahead of him or one step ahead of them. Okay. Which is kind of of fascinating because you're you're literally doing like needle in a desert. It's just one guy in the middle of nothing. Yep. One guy in the middle of nothing. 
Um, he's, I, I think he's mostly like losing him like in the mountains and hilly areas and stuff, you know? Uh, but- sure. He's not running. He's not outrunning <laughs> him in like dune sand. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll, we'll talk. We'll talk. Oh my God. But public opinion is starting to shift because of course, initially you're kind of expecting the police and these rangers are eventually going to grab this person. It's only a matter of time. They have the resources and they have the experience. But the longer and longer it took, the more and more public opinion began to sour. And it was very quickly becoming more of, oh, they can't catch him. They, they won't catch them. They're not smart enough. They're not fast enough. This bandit is too good. He's too good for them. They're never going to catch him. Um, damn, sheriffs. Yeah. This is some and, super trooper shit. And uh, that, that investigator, Jeff Holloway, in a documentary was like, dude, he was becoming a folk hero. People stopped looking at him as a criminal, and they started to root for this upstart bandit because he was giving the police so much trouble. It was like people were forgetting that he was out here robbing tourists and hikers and everybody that was in the desert. And they were like, oh, let's go, Ballarat Bandit. And uh, since the first spot he hit was that little general store in Ballarat, people dubbed him the Ballarat Bandit. And the name just spread like wildfire. Everybody was using it. Magazines, papers, internet forums. Uh, Anybody that talked about him, he was the Ballarat Bandit who was eluding the police and sticking it to the man. So, I I mean... Obviously, anti-police sentiment has increased a lot in the past couple of years. <laughs> yeah. um, but this is in 2004. I, I mean, people were pretty... This is like post-9-11, like, like yeah. Bush administration. People were pretty hot on, on the cops. So I'm actually a True. little bit surprised. Unless they kind of just wanted him to be a Bonnie and Clyde kind of person. That's I'm, I'm thinking that's what it probably was like. They were like, oh, this is... You know, he's just kind of this cool little bandit. He's not really making any trouble. He's not really... There are no acts of violence going on. He's just kind of eluding the police, giving them a hard time. Ah, he's all right. He's just stealing supplies so he can live out there. He's all right. He's all right. Now, if he was murdering people and they were finding, like, you know, body parts all over the place, then I don't think people would be too sweet on him. True, but he was, like, stealing from, like, general stores and stuff. Like, just just good old working people. True, true. He was stealing from general stores. He was stealing from hikers. and eh, So not great, but still, you know? Yeah. Uh, so now we've gone around four months since they really started to try tracking yeah. down the Ballarat Bandit. Yeah, re- real quick, Shy made a good point. He was stealing water from people in Death Valley, which is, which is I mean, he might as well be, be attempting murder at that point. Yeah, I mean, stealing people's supplies in Death Valley is still not great. It's really not. Stealing their water, their food, their supplies when they leave camp to go on nature hikes. Not great. No, no, you're no right. pretty. It's not great. But but I guess I guess public just ha ha he he out out uh, out wrote yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So now we've gone around four months since they really started to try tracking down the Ballarat Bandit and still. Terry and the local authorities are having basically no success. Uh, I would imagine at this point they are absolutely furious because, like, not only can they not find him, not only are people still being burglarized, but the public is siding with this guy. We're trying really hard to find him for your benefit. Um, so I have to believe the pressure to find this guy is absolutely staggering because they want to find him and be like, okay, ha ha, we all had fun. You, you had your cute little folk here, a bandit. We caught him. Everybody shut the fuck up. Let's end this. Uh, and they would finally catch a break, uh, because there were these four off duty police officers from Los Angeles and they were just kind of in the area. They were tourists enjoying nature, hiking, just kind of bonding in the wilderness and so these four- why did you say it that way is this some broke back mountain thing like bonding no, in the I, wilderness in the wild I, I don't know why i said it like that they were just four dudes that were enjoying their time in uh you know maybe they were i don't know shy More i am power making, to them if they shy were. i am making fun of dk that stands no matter Unbelievable, what the context. Unbelievable, Breaky. Unbelievable. How dare you? And so, 
these four off-duty police officers are out in kind of, sort of, no man's land. It's not really no man's land. It's just it's just nature out here. There's really no civilization around. Again, Death Valley. Uh, and while they're out there, they actually stumble upon a man sitting on an ATV that is just fully loaded with supplies. Like, there are enough supplies to almost entirely cover this ATV. Oh, they, wow. Yeah, he yeah, really you is. Can, you can barely tell there's an ATV under there. But they also notice there is a scoped 22 caliber rifle sitting on a bunch of those supplies. So suddenly, being police officers, they're all kind of on super high alert because this guy is just red flag central. Uh, he's out in kind of desolate nowheresville. Uh, nothing he says is adding up. He claimed he was just kind of out here camping but there's no camp gear, and he's just kind of chilling on his ATV that is overburdened with supplies, and it just seems, everything about him seems strange, and none of it sits right with the officers at all. Bro, it's my Starfield character. <laughs> hey, man, you gotta level up that fitness, all right? You, you, gotta, you gotta level up your fitness and, and make sure you can carry more weight. What are you doing? I'm trying. I have to run a lot with high weight. <laughs> The amount of times I run out of O2. So they kind of small talk with him for a little bit. And it doesn't really help because the off-duty officer is just like, nothing this guy says sounds right. He's just like, oh, yeah, I'm just out here camping, enjoying stuff. And they're just like, okay, whatever, dude. And so they start walking away. And one of the officers is like, okay, this is something about that guy's funky. And he turns around, snaps a quick picture when he isn't looking, and he would uh, eventually send this picture, that one that you're seeing right there, uh, to uh, the Inyo County police because he's like, man, I don't, I don't like the feel of this guy. I got to tell somebody about it. It's my duty as a police officer to let the what? local... What? <laughs> what accent was that, dude? I, these, what, are what L, these are L. These are L. A. cops. What, what was? A... <laughs> what was that? It was just an accent. I don't know. What, I don't know what. You, I don't know what you're getting so upset about. I'm, I'm upset for good reason. <laughs> <laughs> but this picture gets emailed to the local authorities, and it does find its way over to Jeff Holloway, same guy that responded to the initial theft in Ballarat. And as he's looking at this picture, he's like, dude, that's the rifle. That's the ATV from from the, the Ballarat General Store. So he's like, okay. It's not a great picture, but we've got a picture of this guy. Not only do we have a picture of this guy, I know that he's still in Death Valley. He hasn't fled off somewhere. He's still in the area, still stealing from people. Okay, so at least, you know what? It's something. It's something. So, uh, again, M.O. of the Ballarat Bandit thus far, he's essentially, essentially he's preying on tourists, hikers, people out here enjoying the wilderness, stuff like that. Scopes them out, watches them from a vantage point, waits for them to leave their camp, and then just robs them blind of whatever supplies he so needs. So, Terry Allen gets word that there are going to be a group of, like, tourists that are going out to this place called the Barker Ranch, which some listeners might be familiar with because that is the same Barker Ranch that Charles Manson used as a hideout. Oh, uh, hot damn. Yeah, and I believe that's actually where he was arrested, and I think he was found, like, hiding under a sink or something. Uh, Charles Char Manson, you mean? Yeah. Or, yeah. okay, because I was like, damn, you just spoiled the, the bandits. He was arrested. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Charles okay. Manson was arrested there. I, I think Charles Manson also felt that, like, there was a, a a secret network of tunnels under Death Valley that he could use to ride out Armageddon or something like that. Charles <sighs> Manson was... Charles Manson thought a lot of things, yeah. Yeah, he is... <laughs> he's not... He was, no, 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 anyway. Um, so this is a fairly infamous place that's going to attract tourists and stuff like that. So it's kind of the perfect spot to keep your eye on if you're the Ballarat bandit, you want to rob tourists, or if you're the police and you're like, well, that seems like a likely target. Anyway, for whatever reason, uh, the group of tourists that was going to go to the Barker Ranch decide, eh, we're not going to go. We're going to cancel the trip. Uh, they hadn't been warned. 
the Rangers didn't flag them down or anything. It was just kind of happenstance. They just decided, eh, we're not going that day. So Terry Allen and another ranger decide, you know what, let's scope out the area anyway. There might not be any tourists here, but you know what, maybe we'll get lucky. Maybe we'll find some kind of evidence that suggests that the Ballarat Bandit was scoping the area out. And to Terry's surprise, he actually does spot tracks that were left by the Bandit's quad. Uh, in Yeah, in the documentary I keep mentioning, Terry specifically said that the quad apparently had some pretty distinct tracks. And I imagine if you've been tracking this guy for four months, it's probably super easy to pick up his specific tracks and footprints. So they start following these tracks for a little bit, and then the tracks turn into footprints. And eventually, they lead to a camp that's sitting in kind of like this low ground surrounded by mountains. Uh, But this time, the campsite was not empty, and the Ballarat Bandit was actually there. So, Terry's got to be on cloud nine, because, oh, I've got the Ballarat Bandit in my sight. I Day and night, for four months, every day, I have been doing nothing but chasing this guy. And now, I got him. He's right there. I got him. But the Ballarat Bandit sees them, and he pops up in surprise. He grabs a bag of essential supplies, and then he takes off like a bat out of hell. Like a bandit out of hell. Never mind. Continue. You you tried. You tried. I tried. It was stupid. Yeah. Go yeah, anyway. Go, okay. go ahead. Go ahead. But so so the Rangers take off after him. Uh, but this bandit, man, they're making no ground on him at all. They're huffing. They're puffing. They've they're giving it all they've got. And these Rangers are by no means out of shape either. They are pretty fit, and they are running as hard as they can. But this bandit doesn't slow down. He just keeps sprinting at this same crazy speed. He is just, he is, as the kids say, he is shamoving. Shamoving? He is shamoving. And so the ranger's like, okay, screw this. We're not making any headway on the guy. Let's get in our Jeep and let's catch him. Let's end this. But they had already been chasing the bandit for like a quarter of a mile. So they've got a little ways to go to get back to their Jeep, and the bandit is still sprinting his brains out the entire time across these desert flats in 120-degree weather. He just doesn't stop. Um, so, <laughs> again, this is the thick of Death Valley. Not a cool spring day. This guy is on a mad dash. And even when the Rangers get back to their Jeep, they said they they had to bring out the binoculars to check and see where he was. He's still running, still in the distance. He's leaving this little puff cloud of sand because he is still just going and just doesn't stop. He is so far away that even in their Jeep, they're like, dude, we can't catch him. He's too far ahead. We're screwed. He got away. Man, adrenaline is a hell of a drug. Apparently, because he just, he outran him. He just completely, and uh, it just added, added another notch to the folk legend that was the Ballarat Bandit, because they they were onto him, and he just, boom, outran him. He just decided to outrun the cops on foot in, like, in Death Valley. In the place named Death. <laughs> yeah, and he just outran him. No problem. They wouldn't even try chasing him in the Jeep. But at the very least, they had a fresh campsite that is full of evidence they could at least potentially use to paint a little better picture of the Ballarat Bandit. Because remember, he he didn't have time to clear anything out. All he had time to do was grab his bag of essentials, hightail it out of there. So maybe, maybe they can figure out motivations, get a better idea of why he's out here, what brought him out here, anything, something. And as they're looking around his campsite, they realize that this guy obviously has to have some knowledge of how to survive in the great outdoors. Not just because he was able to sprint his ass so hard through the desert, uh, but also because, like, despite how his quad looked in that one picture, 
where it looks like he just stacked everything willy-nilly, his campsite is ridiculously well organized. Um, in that documentary, they said that he would bury his trash and his food. Uh, I'm assuming he buried his trash so it wouldn't give away that he was there, because obviously if there's a bunch of trash blowing in the wind, there's just, you know, obviously someone's there. Uh, and I'm assuming he buried his food because, well, he's literally a bandit that steals food and water from other campsites, so I'd assume he buries it so someone else doesn't come along and do to him what he's doing to tourists. Or possibly, like, wildlife. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't want, like, a wolf or something coming around eating all your food. Fair enough. A wolf! I don't know. What, something. What, DK, what? DK what, what do you think lives in Death Valley? I don't know. Scorpions? Wolves? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna lose it. <laughs> what? Uh, they also said that even though he had left the campsite, they could tell that his camp was arranged in such a way that he could very easily pick up, move to another campsite, and not really have to worry about anything that he left behind, like food, water, essentials. So I'm guessing he probably always has like this panic bag right next to him just for such an occasion, so he is always just ready to go. Uh, yeah, well, coyotes, wolves, tomato, tomato, right? Yeah, we're fine. No, he do not give him vindication. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, Shy. You know, it's, it's fine. Don't worry about it. I'm worrying uh, about it. <laughs> but it seemed like the campsite actually made alarm bells start going off for the rangers. Uh, listening to this one documentary again and hearing the officers talk about it, they seemed really worried that he was so willing to just run himself stupid. Uh, and he he did have a bit of a cache of firearms that he stole from people, too, at this campsite. So, Oh, he, maybe he committed a crime a bit more rough than... Exactly. Yeah. They're thinking that maybe he's not out here just for petty theft because he enjoys it. Like, sure... When they eventually catch him, is he going to get put in jail for petty theft of, well, maybe not petty. He's, he's going to bu get put in jail for stealing from people and all that. But it's like, OK, that's not like a life sentence. But if he has a record and he's maybe like a, a lifer that's on the run from jail. That would make him run a little harder or if he was planning something on a much bigger scale, like if he's stealing all this stuff from people because he is preparing to do something a lot worse, you got to be extra careful around him because who knows what he's, they don't know why he's out here. Right. And we, we discussed earlier that you're not really living in death Valley of your own volition. Yeah. There's usually a reason for you to choose to come out to death Valley and like survive here. So, a little more time passes, like a couple weeks or so, and uh, I think they get an anonymous call from just a local, just an anonymous call, and they're like, look, uh, we found a campsite, think it might be one you're looking for, so maybe scope it out, and naturally this time, they're gonna go as hard as they can at this sleep, and not just because they kind of got embarrassed the first time, though I'm sure that played some small role in it, but also because again, they know he's got weapons. They know he's armed. They need to be extra careful and have a proper plan in place. Because again, who knows what his motivations are? Who knows why he's here? Who knows what he's setting up? So they legit get as many Death Valley police and rangers as they can. And they're planning to storm this, this campsite. And not only are they sending in a fully armed ground team, they have helicopters circling the area so that if he tries to pull off this crazy modern marvel of sprinting away again and outrunning them, at least the helicopters are going to be like, okay, we know exactly where he is, here's where he's heading, here's where you gotta go. So they are just like, okay, we are going to get this guy. We got him. The we got the campsite. The big guns. The big guns. And so they, they storm the area, helicopters buzzing overhead. But the Ballarat Bandit is nowhere to be found at the campsite. Is and all this stuff there? They don't really find it. It doesn't seem like they find anything new. They just kind of find an abandoned campsite and they literally spend the rest 
of the day circling the area combing the area helicopters get a better look at stuff tell us where he is what's going on come on and they just come up empty no one can spot him no one sees him he slipped through their fingers again the only moral victory they can take is at the very least they showed the ballarat bandit like this is the force that is looking for you. We have helicopters, we have canine teams, we have armed guys that are looking for you. So at may, maybe it'll maybe it will convince him to just stop robbing people because wow, this sure has gotten a little out of hand just for stealing supplies from tourists. Armed guys, guys with arms, dogs that with arms, armed dogs. <laughs> they're all they've all got arms. They all, all have arms. They're all bearing them. Helicopters <laughs> with arms. And you know, the Ballarat bandit does go quiet for a little bit. Uh according to some of the Rangers, and I think a journalist or someone who is writing a book on it, uh, they believe that the Ballarat bandit did go dark because he saw how crazy this search was getting. Um, you know, after you get your camp raided by helicopters, armed uh, armed police officers, and the whole nine yards, it's like, well, maybe things are getting a little hot. And not in the temperature sense, because it's Death Valley. It's always hot. Don't forget about the armed dogs. Oh, yeah. And, and the armed helicopters. Yeah, And the dogs with arms. Oh, yeah, yeah. Multiple arms, not just not just the four legs they've got. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so the Inyo County police wouldn't hear anything about the Ballarat bandit for several months until they get a bit of a weird call from a place called Nye County. And uh, Nye County is basically like uh, central Nevada for the most part. It's just like this massive, desolate desert area. It's kind of like Death Valley New Game Plus. Maybe not as hot, but <laughs> still, it's just this big, desolate desert area just smack dab in the middle of Nevada. I think Death Valley is already the new Game Plus. This this is this is easy mode, Death Valley. True, true. Maybe, yeah, Death Valley is like, uh, I guess it's the Nye County new Game Plus. Maybe that's a better yeah, word. Hard, hard mode, yeah. But anyway, Inyo County police get a call from the authorities in Nye County, Nevada, uh, because they had this really strange and kind of alarming finding in their area. Uh, so first, there was like this little ranch owned by a man named Donald Jackson, and his ranch was robbed of a tractor battery and, I kid you not, a little red wagon. Not Aww. like a, not like a, not like a red station wagon. This is legit little red wagon that children play with. And according to the documentary, the Ballarat bandit dragged this little red wagon with the tractor battery in it for 10 miles. Uh, no joke. The, um, I think it was Donald Jacks, the owner of the ranch and his, I think it was his son-in-law followed the tracks of this little red wagon and the footprints for 10 miles. Miles. Uh, it should be noted that Donald said that that tractor battery was some 120 pounds. And not only that, apparently the bandit had made several dummy tracks, again, with this 120 pound battery. So he actually probably went more than 10 miles because he made dummy trails that spawned off into nothing and then went about his normal way. Well, now I know why he took the wagon. <laughs> yeah, he took the wagon so we could, you know, drag around the uh, the battery. So, yeah, I, I mean, I guess he had to he had to he had to make sure nobody was following him, just like he did with the ATV back in Death Valley. This guy really is ta taking every possible measure that does make it very suspicious, right? He he knows what he's doing. So what they come upon at the end of these tracks was a Subaru that had been presumably abandoned by the bandit. Uh, I'm assuming he figured, hey, you know, I, I just I need some kind of battery to jump the engine in my dead Subaru. But I'm assuming the tractor battery didn't work out. He probably figured he had to ditch the whole thing before the authorities were on to him. Or he probably did his usual shindig saw them coming like he always does from a solid solid vantage point, and then just hightailed it the hell out of there. 
Uh, but what they discovered when they like ran the plates on the Subaru is that this Subaru had been reported stolen in, you guessed it, Death Valley. And that is why they were following up with the Inyo County Police. Okay, so he he's it you know, it almost sounds like he's trying to like escape. Yeah, it kind of does. In it a does. funny way. Mm-hmm. Like he's 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 trying to lay low, he's trying to get out of dodge, but you know. Uh the other worrying thing about the abandoned Subaru that they found is that they found a load of guns in this little Subaru. Uh, I think the Subaru was a hatchback, kind of looks like a hatchback. I guess it doesn't really matter. Uh, but yeah, he had like, I think they said he had 14 rifles and a bunch of extra scopes stowed away in this car. So this is naturally a problem. Like, they're probably thinking that up until this point, we've been actually kind of lucky that this hasn't devolved into a firefight. Um, and also it, again, it, it puts them on even higher alert because they really, really need to bring this guy to justice somehow because he's stockpiling a lot of weapons like that. One of those campsites they found before had a bunch of firearms. His abandoned Subaru has 14 rifles in it. What the f is he planning to do? This is, um... <sighs> When did we, we, I mentioned earlier, like about the whole, you know, like by like post nine eleven kind of mindset? When was mm. when was Columbine? What year was that? Oh boy, I don't know what year Columbine was. Because I know there there was a lot of like fear, mm -hmm. uh, like during that period of time. Afterwards, nineteen ninety nine. Okay, uh, it's pretty. It's it's in the it's in the ballpark. five years. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay, right. so. They get another lead on a campsite of the Ballarat Bandit, and they're probably like, look, we've really got to take care of this. We don't know who this guy is, why he's out here, what he's capable of. He knows how to survive out here. Like, dude, we... Mm. Um, so, aside from, like... And, and it's weird, because, like, aside from firearms and, like, supplies, he, he's also going after and looting really weird things. Like, he really loves to loot cooking spices and like true crime cassette tapes like cassette tapes that have like true crime stories on them yeah you know i wonder if he had a copy of detective ridiculous all trademarks reserved oh man are we gonna make like retro cassette tapes i would love that that would actually be so cool oh uh, i wait that that's would a great merch idea uh, cassette tapes hell yeah yeah detective ridiculous episode cassette tapes Oh, could you? Yeah, like you could make that a shirt. Ooh, like that ooh. could be the detective ridiculous shirt. It's just like it's this old school retro cassette tape with the logo on it. Million dollars, baby. Million dollars, baby. So they have a lead on another campsite, and the Nye County Police are like, you know what? Let's try to ambush his campsite. You know, we we can ambush it because this campsite only has like two roads leading into it, and and one of them is just like the road goes like right into the mountains. So like, ain't no way he's getting away from us there. So if we ambush him and we get that one road, <laughs> where's he gonna go? Because they haven't heard of the stuff that he's done so far in Knight County. So they're like, this is the chance. We're gonna jump him. We're gonna outsmart him. Ha! <laughs> we we we've, we've got this. We we got him. Um, so they well, get... the play always sunny in Philadelphia <laughs> moment. They did not get him. The, the game well, fails to get the bandit. So from what I could determine, they actually were kind of close to getting him. Like they showed up at this campsite. Right. And uh, there were two Rangers because they didn't want to have this massive force show up that he could see coming a mile away because then he just bails out of there so like there are two rangers and they're and they're gonna ambush him they're gonna get him they're they're like okay all right we've got him and they spot some pretty fresh tracks that are actually heading up the mountain so like oh no we just missed him we gotta go so they took off in that direction they they do call in a SWAT team uh and a dog team too um, and when one of the officers was interviewed, they're like, okay, so we're following these tracks. We are running. We're hauling ass up the mountain. Cause he went, the tracks went straight up the mountain and the officers like, you know, as we were following these tracks, we're looking at the, we're looking at the footprints. 
his goddamn footprints never come together. Ever. And that means this jerk never took a break. He just hauled ass up and over the mountain. He outran them again, but this time he ran up and over a mountain. I don't understand this person. I know, it's crazy. He did it again. This is some kind of like, this is some kind of crap where it's like, uh, it's like Scream, where it's like, <laughs> like, oh my, were you the band the whole time? We both were. <laughs> we in, both in, reali- were yeah. in reality, it's, it's two people because holy shit, the, the volume of stuff he's done. Yeah, it's crazy. And so they're like, well, damn it. Let, we'll investigate the campsite. We'll investigate the campsite. And they, they start to realize that the path that they took, the path they were following up the mountain, there, there are little markers all across this path. The Ballarat Bandit had literally set up markers for his escape route that only he would recognize. They were markers that he was like, okay, if I follow this path, I can just bolt right through there and I never need to stop. And uh, one of the officers that was chasing him down, his name was Ken Guthridge, said in that documentary I keep mentioning, because it was a pretty good source, uh, that with everything he found, he believed that the Ballarat Bandit had to have some kind of military training because the stuff he was doing, that was stuff that Ken legitimately learned in light infantry training. So now they're like, dude, this this is some kind of ex-military guy. Like I, I can see that, like a, like just a guy out of the service, you know. Yeah, yeah, and and he's using his training to not only evade police officers, but also to take advantage of the local populace and rob people and stuff like that. And man, no matter how hard they try, they just cannot catch him. No matter how many people they send out to patrol the deserts of Nevada, nothing comes back, and they just cannot get the jump on the Ballarat Bandit. And this goes on for an additional six months. Oh my, uh, oh my God. Six months. How, uh, how is he, is he, he's still stealing from people this whole time? Yeah, he's still stealing supplies. He's still robbing ranches and stuff like that. But that six months wasn't necessarily wasted because they did pick up a few things about the Ballarat Bandit from some of the campsites that they found. And these discoveries would actually make them really want to, like, ramp up their efforts and be like, whoa, the situation might be a little more dire than we first imagined. Oh, is is this the time where we find out he never existed? No. We don't find that out. No, sorry. So, aside from the guns being an obvious worry, what they also found in some of his campsites were military maps, which not Ooh. a great yeah, not a great thing to find at the bandit's camp when you think he's an ex-military dude. Um, but the other thing that they realized that made them really super worried is they start to, like, you know, they've got their little pin board of evidence and, what is it, Pepe Sylvia, you know, and they're looking at everything, (laughs) and they're like, huh, you know, a bunch of his campsites, they're really close to top-secret military bases. Like, he was camping, a bunch of his campsites are really close to Area 51. Like, when he was in, uh, and, and when he was in Death Valley, they were like, wait a minute, bunch of his campsites were really close to uh the china lake naval air weapons base like oh that's actually really funny my my dad lived around ridgecrest for a while and they would kind of go out near the china lake area okay yeah 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 but they're like man a lot of his campsites are really close to like top secret military encampments and now they're starting to worry that like he's he he might be ex-military but what if this is like a terrorist what if he's scoping out high value targets because again this is 2004 9 11 just happened it's still fresh in everyone's mind so if this guy's camping around top secret military bases specifically and he has military training we we gotta find this guy now like this this could be catastrophic if we don't find him because what is he doing why, why is he camping near these military inst- Why is he stockpiling? What is he doing? 
It's like the kids would say, a little sus. Yeah, it's a little sus. It is well, it is very sus. At yeah, this point. it's actually are, extremely sus. They are very worried. So they have people from Inyo County and Nevada combing the deserts again, literally day and night. They want to leave no stone unturned looking for this guy because if he's <laughs> if he's planning what they think they're planning, this is a problem. They they also get so worried about it. They call in the Department of Homeland Security and they get them to send search planes. They get them to send helicopters and they're making damn sure that if he's hiding in some little draw in the mountains or some little outcrop in the middle of nowhere, they're going to find his ass. Disgruntled ex-military guy stalking up for a raid is 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 pretty is a pretty rough one. Yeah, that's... But even with all of this extra manpower combing Nevada, he still manages to keep one step ahead of them. Like, it's crazy. He's still burglarizing ranches, still stealing cars as he's moving through the area, and they're still finding his abandoned campsites all over the place. So they kind of know the general direction that he's moving, and he's, he's kind of moving north, but then he just, poof, just comb kind of, eh. the desert. Yeah, comb with literal comb, indeed. Um, and I think uh, he ends up stealing a uh, a Toyota, uh, a Ford pickup truck, and I think he has to steal another different ATV just so we can, you know, properly move through. Um, but yeah, so he's moving through like northern Nevada, and then just the trail goes cold, and he vanishes again, uh, which. For the Ballarat Bandit, that's probably the smart thing to do. Uh, he, there's no way he doesn't realize that all of this mass of humanity is there for him to capture him. This, my friend, is the time to lay low. Cool it on the burglaries. Unless you really, really, really need water and food, there is no need to do anything. Just at this point, he's got to be thinking, I need to chill. And just lay low, and I need to just not be seen. You know, in fairness, uh, I mean, he might need these things because he is in. Um, oh, what's the name of this place again? <laughs> well, um, he's in. He's in Nevada now. You know. Oh, that, that's true. Oh, oh wait, no. <laughs> that, so? that doesn't make it any better. He's still no. in the desert. He's still in the middle of a desolate desert. He still needs those things. People forget that Vegas is not some coastal city. It's in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> yeah, it is a desert. Last, the Strip is great, but outside of the Strip, eh, not so There's much. There's nothing. Have you not nothing. played Fallout New Vegas? <laughs> But Terry Allen is thinking this too. He's like, you know what? You he probably is trying to lay low. And he he kind of thought that, you know what? That bandit, he might straight up just not be in Nevada anymore. Like it's gotten so hot with patrols and helicopters and the Department of Homeland Security is there. So his thought process is like, you know what? What if the Ballarat bandit isn't in Nevada? And if he's looking for safe haven, what if he went back to one of his old hideouts where nobody would think to look for him? You know, kind of hiding in plain sight because they can't see the forest for the trees. So Terry Allen is actually checking out one of the old uh, cabins that the bandit used to hang out in. Uh, and he says when he comes up on this cabin, he can smell smoke like maybe someone had been cooking, you know. Um, and when he entered the cabin, nobody was there. But... He found a half-smoked joint that was still smoldering. So he's like, ooh, he was here. Maybe he saw me come and he heard the Jeep and he just, he bailed. Must have oh, been in a hurry. Yeah, still smoldering is like. Yeah, that thing was still smoking. That's out of a movie. Mm-hmm. Also in the area, there's another ranger that's kind of just out on patrol, looking around, doing his job. And he spots this really weird-looking Chevy flatbed truck. It's this kind of ugly lime green colored thing and it has all these like little five gallon buckets around it's got a bunch of stuff in the bed and it's it's just kind of out in the flats like it's not all abandoned and picked to death or anything it's just kind of like there uh so the ranger his name is uh david brenner uh decides to check it out and in one of these little buckets, there's some marijuana plants in them, like little potted marijuana plants. Man, man it, was smoking joints in 2004 in the middle of Nevada? 
Mm-hmm. And at this, there's just tiny little saplings at this point, just little, just little sproutlings. Um, but they're also cooking supplies. There are these two wooden planks that are uh, on the on the flatbed, which is probably a ramp for an ATV or something. Uh, in the driver's seat, he found a 22 rifle, some credit cards, and a driver's license for a man named Seth D. D's nuts. I was waiting for it. I was giving you a chance. You knew it was yeah, coming. Yeah, I did. I knew. I knew. Uh, and this is one instance where luck was not on the bandit's side because this particular ranger, Dave Brenner, had been working on the Ballarat bandit case pretty much the whole time. And he specifically remembered that stolen Subaru that was found abandoned in Nevada, the one that uh, the bandit tried to jumpstart with the tractor battery. That car was stolen from a man named Seth D. And oh, this, damn it. This was his stolen driver's license. Oh, I thought we knew the bandit's name. No, no, we didn't. So Dave Brenner immediately, even though he's like, okay, that's not the bandit's name and identity, but dude, this is his stuff. This is his truck. This is his weed. This is his gun. These are his supplies. Dude, we've got, I've got him. Man smoking a J out in the middle of Nevada while arming for the for Y two K. Oh wait, that we're past Y two K. While arming that. for the apocalypse. Yeah, uh, but would you believe it? In this remote area of Death Valley, Dave Brenner can't get a signal. He can't call for backup yet. So, <sighs> so he does the smart thing, and he's like, "Okay, let me go ahead and disable the Chevy's engine." Because if, if, if I got to gotta go out a little bit ways to get a signal, I got to make sure that if the bandit comes back, he can't leave. So he does that, disables the Chevy's engine, and he has to drive out a little way so he can get a signal to call for backup and be like, guys, I found him. I know where he is. He, ooh, it's, it's, it's right here. It's right here. It's right here. So he does that. Uh, but when he comes back to the campsite, it's actually super clear that the bandit had returned uh because when dave brenner left he left um i'm not sure which door he left open but he left one of them open comes back the door is closed and that, there I, is, my my heart would be pumping right and there was a visible shoe print on the side of the door bandit must have come back to the camp realized his hideout had been found his truck disabled and he just oh damn it and he kicks the door shut uh, and since he couldn't use the truck, since it, was, since it was disabled, the bandit takes off in his ATV, which left obvious tracks leading away from the truck. So, like, Dave got him on the run, and Dave Brenner's just like, dude, what? like, and he calls it, and he's like, these tracks are leading away, you know, we, we got him. We've got him. And uh, at this point, people might be thinking, well, whatever. Ballarat Ban is just going to fool him again, like he always does. He's going to outsmart him. You know, he's going to outmaneuver him. He's going to outsprint him in the desert. It'll be fine. Big problem is it seems like the Ballarat Bandit did not expect them to find him uh, because it seems like he was just completely unprepared for this moment and he didn't have his usual, like, well thought out escape route to dodge the authorities. Um, cause usually he'll like, you know, he'll, he'll hit the mountains, he'll hit high ground or something like that. But these tracks are just leading right into flats. They're not leading to any mountainous area. They're not leading to any brush area or anything like that. They're just going right into the open valleys of the scorching death valley heat that he returned to. So at this point, I got to believe that they're like, okay. This manhunt for the Ballarat Bandit is coming to a close today. Even if he's got an emergency bag of supplies with him, you only got so much gasoline in that ATV. Those supplies are only going to last you for so long. The direction he headed in, there's nowhere for him to hide. He finally made a mistake, and they are ready to pounce on this guy. So, it would be a ranger named Patrick Shields that finally spotted the Ballarat Bandit. Uh, but at the time, when he did spot him, he wasn't sure it was him. Because as he's patrolling around, he's like, okay, you know, I'm looking around. He spots someone that's sitting by a call box with, like, one of those red plastic gasoline jugs. And he looks completely spent, exhausted, malnourished, and probably like he's just going to keel over. Um, and this is basically maybe a little way into the San Bernardino County, 
Um, and for some reason, Patrick Shields initially just kind of drives past, you know, thinking it was strange seeing someone in such distress, but he just kind of drives past. But eventually he turns back and he wants to check on this man. He's probably thinking, you know what? That was a pretty destitute looking dude. I should probably check on him, make sure he's okay, you know, stuff like that. Or in the back of his head, he might have been like, hey, I mean, this, I'm out here patrolling. This is the, this might be the guy that we're looking for. I mean, he's getting supplies. Don't they have like a profile on the guy, though? Well, they've got they they have a drawing of what they think he looks like, but there was like a problem because like the Inyo County did a police sketch of him, right? And the Nye County did a police sketch of him, and if I remember correctly, there was some dispute about them not looking the same and the sketches being a little different. So they kind of sort of have a sketch on him. They kind of sort of know what he looks like, but, you know. Uh, but when Patrick Shields makes his way uh, back to this call box, nobody's there. Uh, there's some footprints leading away from it. So Patrick Shield calls in to Dave Brenner, and I he, he describes the tracks. He describes the footprints to Dave Brenner, uh, and Dave Brenner's like, that's him, that's him, that's him. Oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, that's him. Him. Those are the tracks. That's this. That's that sounds like the footprint I saw on the side of the Chevy. We've got him. We've got him. And so they get 15 Rangers armed with AR 15s. They've got planes and helicopters swooping over the area. There is nowhere for the Ballarat bandit to run to. Um, and man, as as they are coming up on where these tracks lead, those rangers have got to be gripping their AR-15s tight, 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 tight. Because who knows what you're walking into. There's nowhere for the bandit to run and hide anymore. He's probably out of supplies. He's exhausted. A cornered animal is the most dangerous animal, right? So these 15 rangers are coming up. On, on the Ballarat Bandit. They spot him. He's sitting under a tarp that he hooked up to his worn-out ATV so he could at least get some, like, relief from the heat. Uh, and they're, like, they're doing the race. of like, police, don't move. We've got you surrounded. There's nowhere for you to run. The usual stuff. And they notice that he's got that twenty two rifle again. And everybody kind of tenses up because the range's like, yo, he's got a gun. Oh, my God, he's got a gun. And so they're just on high alert. They don't know what his motivations are. He might be a common criminal, might be ex-military, might be a tourist. Who knows? And before they know it, they're creeping up on this makeshift camp. And, you know, they're announcing that they're there, you know, put everything down. Don't move, freeze. And bang, gunshot rings out. And I think at this point, they all like hit the deck, you know, shots fired. And they're just like, oh, my God, we're in a firefight. But a second shot never comes. It's just the eerie desert quiet. And as they creep up on the camp, they see that the Ballarat bandit had taken his own life with that twenty-two caliber rifle. Ah, I was like, I was like, okay, bandit man's got one or two options. It's either it's either he kills himself or he fired Mm -hmm. and then just started running away. Yep. Like, cause, hunt- cause he's really good at the running part. Yeah, he was, but he was completely spent too. Like he was just done. That, yeah, that's true. He was all malnourished and stuff, but I, I mean, I don't know, man, this guy was huffing. He was a lot. He was. And so the hunt for the Ballarat bandit was finally over. And I all right. Ta- even- I want to know. I want to know about his notes. I want to know about his, his journal. <laughs> I want to know about all his stuff. And even after the Ballarat bandit died, they still didn't know who he was for a really long time. When they came up to his body after he had died, he was completely naked, stripped everything off, and there was basically no trace of who he was. Didn't have any ID on him, there was no manifesto at his campsite or anything like that, just what few supplies he had before he just took his own life. This man's really gonna, really just gonna hit me with the uh, the nothing answer. So naturally, when you want a body identified and you want to know more about it, you send it to the police coroner, and you get the fingerprints, the dentals, whatever you can checked out in their database. And surely you're gonna get a hit back on something. Something's gonna key you in to who this man was. 
And since they are basically in the San Bernardino County, the body was handed over to a coroner named David Van Norman in the San Bernardino Police Coroner's Office. And this guy is a cocky guy. Uh, in that uh, documentary, he was interviewed and his statement was like, you know, I'm pretty arrogant. I'm never going to fail. I'm always going to figure out who these people are, which is probably the mindset you kind of have to have if you're going to be a police coroner. Anyway, first thing he does is run the prints, and uh, which is logical first place to start. But the fingerprints don't yield any results. No matches. So he starts doing DNA tests, dental tests, any test he can think up, and they all turn up negative. No results. They can't figure out who the hell this guy is or what he was doing in the area. Somehow, even when the Ballarat bandit was dead and gone, he was still eluding the police. He was still putting them on the chase. And it would take a long, long time before Van Norman got any results. Like, it took so long. He had to take the body out of refrigeration and bury it because it was coming up on a whole goddamn year since the body had come to him wait bury it do you mean like put on ice no like so i guess the coroner's office has this little potter's yard and any sort of unidentified bodies that they have i guess after a year they have to bury them in that potter's yard in like unmarked graves what the hell Apparently that's a thing, because that's what they did. They buried him in, like, a potter's yard uh, that Van Norman sees to, like, all the time in the, I guess, in out back of the coroner's office or something. It's something like that. That is incredibly bizarre. I had no idea that was a thing. Yeah, I, I didn't either until this. But again, Van Norman, like you said, he's an arrogant guy. It's not going to fail. And he's been obsessing over this thing the whole time, the whole year, still trying to figure out who this guy is. And he gets so desperate that he sends out photos of the Ballarat Bandit via email to, like, every police office he can think of, to media outlets, to anybody, in hopes that somebody knew who this guy was and what he was doing here and why he did what he did. Are you allowed to do that? (laughs) Apparently, because he did it. And he did get a reply that actually kind of helped. It wasn't from the police, and it wasn't from media. He got an anonymous email that read, I'm sure you've already thought of this, but who talks like an American, looks like an American, acts like an American, but isn't an American? A Canadian. Maybe the bandit is a Canadian. What a, what a weird thing to say. What? Yeah, it's just anonymous emails like, hey, here's my two cents. Maybe he's Canadian. So Van Norman's like, you know what? I got nothing left to lose. I haven't got any hits in America. And you know what? Him being from Canada, kind of a novel idea. So he sends what he has to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. At this point, I'm not sure what he was expecting. Maybe he thought it was a wild goose chase. But he's like, you know what? It couldn't hurt. But, you know, I find nothing. Same as everything else. But after four months of waiting, Van Norman got a call that the prince had been matched and that they had the identity of the Ballarat bandit. And before I tell you specifics, Bricky, I am curious, what what direction do you think this is going to go? Do you think he was a petty thief that was in over his head? Some wilderness survival freak gone rogue? Maybe a disgruntled ex-military man with a bone to pick? Or was he actually a Arrest. Uh, I mean, at this point, I'm kind of under I'm kind of in the the whole disgruntled military man vibe. OK, OK. Um, so you, th- you think he's ex-military? All right. All right. Uh, it's an option. Definitely. Sure. Sure. So that's that's the direction you're leaning in. Yeah. Yeah. Why not? Why the hell not? OK. OK. So are you are you ready to hear who the Ballarat bandit actually was? Uh, it's, yeah, I, it's sure. His name was George Robert Johnston. Wasn't a terrorist. He wasn't ex-military. It's just a guy that did drywall from Canada. 
Just okay, to, it's a it's a, it's a little more complicated than he was yeah, just some dude that did drywall from Canada. I'm like, I, I understand this is this is probably setting up as as a as a joke thing or something, but I'm assuming there's more. There is more. Uh, so George did have a history of kind of getting mixed up in drugs. Uh, when he was younger, he loved to live as fast as possible. He just loved the speed. He wanted to become a race car driver. He convinced his parents to let him attend racing school. Uh, but he got kicked out because uh, they just wouldn't let him go fast enough. Uh, and apparently he was making uh, weird modifications to his cars. Like, I read an article that said he removed the governor from his engine. And I was like, I have no idea what that means. I don't do cars i don't do i don't know what that means but apparently you're not supposed to do it and they wouldn't let him go fast enough uh in high school uh he was caught for selling marijuana and uh he would spend some time in juvenile detention for it and uh, that put him on the straight and narrow for a while and when he grew up he pursued an honest living doing drywalling for a for a career um, and he was really good at it because apparently uh, George Robert Johnston had kind of an obsessive attitude where once he got into something, he obsessed over it and he got really, really good at it. I, I, I mean, this, this explains the pot part, at least. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, we, we, <laughs> we <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Uh, and uh, he would eventually marry a woman named Tommy. And they would have four daughters together. And I think Tommy had a, a son from a previous marriage that she was having legal troubles with. Uh, they moved to Arizona for a little while. And uh, they kept under the radar because George had a really paranoid worldview. Like, he didn't like the government. He thought they were out to ruin the world. So he, he didn't socialize much. He was kind of introverted. And it wasn't until his wife was diagnosed with leukemia that they decide we're moving back to Canada. Uh, Prince Edward Island specifically, because uh, we want to be closer to family, because leukemia, leukemia sucks. Um, it was also around this time that George would start to get really serious about growing marijuana uh, in order to not only ease his wife's pain with leukemia, but also to make a little scratch on the side. Uh, the way I read it in an article was, uh, I guess somebody gave Tommy uh, a joint uh, because she's dealing with the pain of leukemia. She's got no appetite. She can't sleep. And it's just awful. And uh, as soon as she smoked this joint, she was like, whoa, my appetite's back. I'm not in as much pain. And God, this is like the first uh, this is this is like the first peaceful sleep I've had in a really long time. This is great. And so George is like, yeah, well, you know what? F it. F the government's drug laws. I'm going to home grow you the best weed you've ever had. Listen, wife, I am going to make you so damn comfortable. <laughs> wife? I, I don't know if he actually said that. That was just kind of an on-the-spot thing. <laughs> Listen <yeah>. here, wife. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've teleported myself back to the 1930s, apparently. Anyway, so he obsesses over making the best weed possible and like i said he has an obsessive nature so when he puts his mind to something boy he is gonna do it and he is gonna do it properly like he's using underground farms he's using solar energy he is using all the tricks uh to make sure he is making the best best weed possible and apparently he got so obsessed and he he made some real premium shit like, sure, it made his wife comfortable, but when he started selling it, if the article I read is accurate, he made, like, 100K his first year selling it. That is actually extremely impressive, yeah. Yeah, yeah, especially in 2000. Uh, well, I guess this would be, like, 2002, 2003 That's That's really good money for that time frame. Yeah. And George is also super confident that he's, he's never going to be found out. He was good at hiding, good at eluding people, this fast guy because he loved the speed so much. Um, and also, he had a really low opinion of the government, so he figured his he was rock solid. But his wife is getting a little worried about the whole thing. Like, obviously, she thinks it's great that he's trying to help her out, and the money is nice, but she also doesn't want to see her husband arrested and leave the kids without a father. Uh, so she gives it to him straight. It's either her and the family or his marijuana farm. One or the other. 
And one of the articles I read paints this really sad depiction of like after she says this, he's like, okay, babe, you know, and he gets down on one knee. He properly proposes to her and he's like, look, one more harvest, a little safety net cash, and then we call it quits. And then like the next day, one of the neighbor's pigs gets out from their farm and I guess chews its way through like one of the fences in George's place runs through the field the neighbor comes running in after like oh i'm so sorry about the pig and he's right in the middle of this marijuana farm and he turns george in oh crap yep and george was sentenced to i think four years in prison which was lowered from the 12 years uh because he could have had 12 years but he cooperated and i guess he got a plea deal or something so it was reduced to four um, but he only spent about a year of that sentence in prison. Um, but his mental health took a massive spiral downwards. Uh, because he was kind of obsessive and paranoid person, life on the inside was really, really brutal on him. He couldn't sleep. He was uneasy all the time. Uh, according to his wife, Tommy, when he asked for medication to help him sleep, they gave him some weird prescription pills that weren't actually meant for use as a sleeping aid, and instead they made him, like, even more paranoid. Uh, they caused hallucinations, they gave him anxiety attacks, and it just really, really screwed him up. Like, she said she could tell he had some kind of mental breakdown in prison after just, like, a week. It hit him hard, and it hit him fast. So... When he was paroled in 2000, because he only spent about a year in prison, his life was a total mess. Like, he couldn't do a whole lot. Uh, the article said that Tommy mentioned he would kind of just sit and hide in his closet, weeping all day, tugging at his beard, just very kind of, like, manic, depressed. Um, and eventually, later that year, George would leave his family, who were now in British Columbia, and he would make a trek to the United States. His intention was he just, he wanted to find a faith healer that could help him. Uh, he could be out in the wilderness. He loved the wide open wilderness. Uh, according to his wife, Tommy, he, he loved the romantic idea that he could live out in the wilderness where a man could be a man, a woman could be a woman, and a handshake meant something. So he's just, he felt really guilty um, about his mental condition. He felt like he was ruining the family, that he was just this massive burden, and he just hated seeing what he was doing to his family. So he just, he wanted to head out to the States, find a faith healer, get his mind right, and then come back to his family and live happily ever after. Is there any particular reason why he chose the States to find a faith healer? Was there not one in, in Canada, or did he just sick of the Canadian government? Uh, probably all of the above. And like I said, he really liked the sort of desert wilderness. And he was just like, oh, that that's going to be the, the land that gives me peace. And maybe that's where I'll find my faith healer. And that's how I'll get my mind right. I was just, I was just thinking, because like, if, if he likes the, the wilderness, he's got plenty of that in Canada. Yeah, in Canada, sure. But he so. might like like deserts and, you know. Sure. Um, And that's what led George Robert Johnston, the Ballarat Bandit, into death valley that's why he was there and it seems like and it just seems like his mental health did not get better no he it did, did not, not get better and yep you know, it seems like it just got worse and he just got more manic and he just got more paranoid and um obviously uh the wife was completely flabbergasted when she heard the news if i'm not mistaken they actually heard that he was the ballarat bandit um because i think one of their daughters saw a news clipping about it and they saw his identity in there and um and then of course they got the call from the coroner that was like hey you know we got to talk to you about your husband and yeah that's not great. You know, I'm I'm not going to lie. Um yeah, he was probably just was horribly confused while he was being chased by the military oh, yeah. for stealing food and water on a quad. From from the point of view of George Robert Johnston, he must have been absolutely just so confused as to why such a massive force was coming after him. Did he not yeah, he, he stole so many guns though? 
He did. I'm not sure what the reason... Again, that might just because he was confused. He didn't like the government. You know, it might be just kind of one of those anarchist things where it's like, oh, I have to I have to properly prepare for anything. You know what I mean? Um, so... Yeah, from his point of view, it's just like, oh my god. And and of course, Tommy's like, why didn't anybody try to help him? Like, you're chasing this guy, and there's obviously something wrong. He's not violent. Why didn't anybody try to help him? He's clearly crazy. He's clearly having a mental breakdown. Why did you... Go- like, and when you send that many people after him, what did you expect him to do besides run? And Welcome well, you can't really to blame America. the police. Welcome to America, baby. Enjoy your welcome. Mm -hmm. And of course, like the police, 9-11 had just happened. They're on super high alert. They don't know why he's out here. It's not like they can just kind of tiptoe around it. So it's it's just a bad situation all around. It is a real bad situation all around. And he is... Uh, as far as I know, uh, his body is still in San Bernardino in that uh, in that coroner's little potter yard or whatever. Um, and the family is trying to get his body uh, exhumed and brought back to Canada so his final resting place can be with them. Still? Still. I think After 20 there. years? I believe so. I, well, I don't know. Uh, the documentary and most of the sources I've seen were written a while ago, like 10 years ago or something. So maybe they got him back, but I didn't, there are shockingly not a lot of sources on the Ballarat bandit. There's a couple YouTube videos. Uh, one of them was the true TV documentary. I mentioned there's maybe two articles and like two videos of like other true kind, true crime podcasts that mention the stuff that happened, but there's shockingly little out there about him. I'm, you know, my opinion of him softened a lot when I heard about his wife and mm-hmm. everything, but I, I'm not going to lie. I like, like okay, it's, it's very obvious he had a mental breakdown in prison. Oh, yeah. Very, no very obvious. About that. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. But at the same time, I, I feel like abandoning his leukemia uh, stricken wife to go on a on a spirit journey it feels rather r- irresponsible as well. True, but at the time, like, his mental health was so bad that the care dynamic had completely shifted. If I remember mm, right, they were like, point. they were like, at that point, it was basically the leukemia ridden wife that was trying to uh, care give for just this mentally broken man that was just a pile of depression and, and anxiety and worry and paranoia that was just sitting in the closet weeping all day. So, I um, wonder what happened to him in prison. He just had a mental if breakdown. They're... Like prison just does that to people. And and like we said, he was already he was already kind of paranoid and obsessive and not sleeping. And then they give him these medications that just don't jive with him at all. And he just poof. I I guess maybe yeah, I guess the medication could have definitely played a role into it. But considering yep. that he wasn't there for well, a year is a long time still. It's just yeah. it's interesting to to see how significant of a breakdown it was and it's it's like a little i don't know i mean yeah. obviously i've never been to prison i can't i can't really discuss it but yeah, um, hopefully it stays that way hopefully it does stay that way maybe maybe the guy was just like a your classic hippie because you know he, he was a bit of a hippie kind of kind of guy maybe just kinda, sure. going to going to prison just the the fact of being in prison just screwed with him so so yeah. much and in his mind, he probably didn't want to go back because prison is what started this whole mess to begin with. It screwed him up so bad. That's why he was trying to look for the faith. He was, he was like, no, I'm not going back. It also does explain F-F. why he was running so hard. Like, so I don't, hard. Yep. Yeah, I don't want to go back to prison, not because of the uh, not. I mean, obviously, I don't want to go to prison. That's bad. But because the last time I went to prison, it ruined me. Ruined you. Yep. And it ruined the family. It broke up the family, basically. And yes. Uh, and most people like, you know, if 9-11 hadn't happened, probably wouldn't have been as big of a deal as it was. They probably wouldn't have assumed he was a terrorist. Uh, and, you know, he probably would have just gone down in history as just some rogue outlaw. And they wouldn't have tried so hard to, you know. Yeah, This really does feel like a major, like like 9-11 was a big part of this because, oh, yeah. um, because like it's r- right after this dude getting guns at a military base, like. I mean, yeah. we are still suffering the effects of 9-11 in our, in our fucking airports. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. You know? And this was only a couple of years after, so they're even on higher alert. And 
So you can't really blame the police either, because I know <laughs> uh, in the few interviews I saw with Tommy, she is very critical of the police not trying to help, being like, oh, yeah, they're just a bunch of bozos chasing, chasing a crazy guy through the desert, and they refuse to help him. And it's like, yeah, but again, considering what's just happened, and they don't know, and he's stockpiling guns, and like, what are they supposed to do at that point, right? Like in it's, hindsight, yeah. it's easy to be like, "Oh, come on, he was just a he was just an outlaw guy." It's like, yeah, it's post nine eleven guns. You don't know the motivation. There's a military base here. There's a military base there. Uh, what are they supposed to do? It, it's it's definitely one of those things where like you you wish times were just simply different. Like it's it's hard yeah, to oh, yeah. it's really hard to to. Uh, explain for I mean I'm sure we have we have fans that were probably born uh, after 9-11 you know people who were born after 9-11 can drink now which is insane oh, that um, makes me feel so old why did you say that I, I know I'm sorry why it, did it happened, you say that it happened 22 years ago why did you say <laughs> that why did you tell me that but but <laughs> to, to continue um to continue that point the the whole like it's hard to describe especially now with how hypercritical uh we are in this day and age of the american government and stuff like that how like rabid people were after oh, yeah. after 911 how much oh, yeah. they were like hell yeah war let's oh, go yeah. it's it was- crazy yeah, the country wanted blood. Yeah, like the so. I, I I think th- this might be wrong, but I think it was like one of the highest approval rates ratings for any president in a while was right after that. Probably. It was it was, it was yeah. pretty crazy. So yeah. it, it it makes a lot more sense now thinking of like why they just they hunted this man across yeah. Death Valley. Department of Homeland Security helicopters, search planes, K nine teams. AR-15 armed rangers, like, yeah, they, they they thought they had a terrorist on their hands. Is AR-15, like, like really that big of a deal? Mm, I guess not really in the grand scheme. I mean, it's it's more than a 22. <laughs> it, it is it is certainly more than a 22. It's more than a 22, anyway, yeah. Anyway, but that is the Ballarat Bandit. And unless I missed anything, Shy, that you, you would like to add, that is what I have on the Ballarat Bandit. The Ballarat Bandit, he the says. The Ballarat Bandit. The bandit from a ghost town. The bandit from Canada. Yeah, the drywalling bandit from Canada. Oh. Yeah, that's that's it. That's the that's the show. Hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, and it was uh, it was it was about as long as I thought it was going to be. You know, this is one of those situations where I just feel like nobody won. No, definitely nobody won. Um, I think I'm trying to remember. I think it was a in, in that same documentary. It was David Brenner. He was like, you know, uh, in hindsight, yeah, it was just a bad situation. And now when when something weird like this happens, now I'm just like, oh yeah, that Ballarat Bandit thing. I should maybe look at this from a different point of view and not immediately jump to like, oh my god, terrorism. Yeah, yeah, that's well, that, that's that's good that there was a little bit of hindsight at least available. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Shy says, "Imagine the faces of the police when they're like, we figured out who he was. He wasn't a super agent or terrorist or ex-military. You were completely out physiqued, outsmarted, and outmanned." By, By a mentally an- ill drywall Canadian, Canadian guy. guy yeah. No, you're, you're forgetting the stoner part. Yeah, I mean he, yeah, and, Man. and like apparently he he made some crazy hybrid of uh, marijuana too that everybody was very impressed with. Crystal blue, blue persuasion. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Well, there you go. Interesting story. Not how I yeah. thought it was going to go. Me too. Me too. When I was researching this, I was like, okay, surely this has got to be some some kind of crazy special angel. Like, no, Canadian drywaller that was just not having a good time. And it was like, oh, well, I like sad. I like that phrase. Yeah, no, just Canadian drywaller. Yeah, and it's just like, oh, that's. Oh, and then as you hear the details, it's like, oh, well, this is, well. My day I'm, just got a lot more depressing. I'm not happy anymore. This was yeah. fun, and now it's not. <laughs> I lost my smile. Anyway. All right. Take us home, Bricky. Uh, thanks for, for listening, everyone. Remember, if you're going to outrun the police, smoke more weed.
<laughs> we here at Adeptus Ridicus do not recommend outrunning the police while on weed. We do recommend weed. God damn it, Bricky. God 